Once you learn this method, you'll use it forever. Identification, putting a name on a bird, is the foundation of recreational birding. Beginners may struggle to put a name on common birds at their feeder, but identifying some birds can be challenging even for experts. And that's part of what makes it so fun. This video shows how to avoid becoming completely fooled when identifying birds. No more picture matching turning page by page. You're going to become more confident in your identifications. There's a short story that exemplifies being fooled by an identification. A woman found an injured bird. Now, she wasn't an experienced bird watcher, but she had a field guide and she looked it up. She saw the black and white back and the sharp pointed bill, and she identified it as a common loon. It was one of the first birds in her bird book. So she put it in a bathtub to recuperate. It did not go well. It turns out the bird was a hairy woodpecker. By the way, if you know where this story comes from, could you let me know in the comments? I've been looking to refind it for years. This video delves deeply into identification. I don't want to overwhelm you. I just want to show you what's possible. You don't have to know it all before starting to identify birds. But once you learn this method, you'll use it forever. And if we do make a mistake using this method, it's likely to be a closely related species and not something wildly different. We want to catch our own mistakes before we report our sightings to others. Let me introduce you to the foolproof bird identification method. Step one is size and shape. Two, color and pattern. Three, behavior and vocalizations. Four, distribution and habitat. And then five, similar species. Bird identification starts with shapes and proportions. Beginners and non-birders are often too focused on color. Fixating early on color often leads to identification errors. So this is where we start. This topic isn't covered very well in the field guides. I want to explain it well so that you can immediately use it to improve your bird watching skill. The outline or silhouette of a bird is very important for coming to an accurate identification. Is the bird plump or thin? Is the neck short and thick or long and skinny? Is the tail rounded or forked? Are the legs long or short? Are the toes webbed? Are the wings in flight long or short, rounded or pointed? Is the bill straight or curved? These external structural characters may be found in a manual on ornithology. But study the introduction to your field guide. Many of these are there. I also recommend the book National Geographic Birding Essentials by Alderfer and Dunn. I'll put a link in the description. And of course, I plan on making a parts of the bird video soon. You should subscribe so you don't miss it. Look at this bird. Most people are going to recognize that this brown barred bird is not a similarly colored owl or sparrow. It doesn't have the right shape. With that upright posture, long legs and long thin bill, you probably recognize the shape as some kind of sandpiper or shorebird. What else do we see? A bird with a long body, definite neck, very long legs, and long tubular bill. The silhouette shows some details better than the colored image. Notice the short tail with the wingtips extending just past. The hind toe is very short and elevated above the front toes, so this bird is not a perching bird. There are no other birds present in this photo, so we can't compare size. Or can we? Measure the bird against itself. Let's just use the head as a measuring device. From the base of the bill to the back of the head. How long is the bill? More than twice the width of the head. How long is the neck? A little less than one head from the back to the base of the skull. The lower part of the leg, the tarsus, is two heads tall, from the toes up to the tibiotarsal joint. And from that joint upward, there's a full head length before the feathers of the tibia start. In total, from the toes to the body, the legs are almost four heads tall. Those are long legs. Compare the head to the body. The body is about five heads long, now, don't include the neck or the tail. This is a larger bird. 
how do we know? Smaller birds have body lengths of only two or three heads. On such small birds, the head seems to merge into the body without an obvious neck. The slightly upturned bill is a very good identification clue. The thicker bill eliminates yellow legs, stilts, and avocets. The gradually thinning bill eliminates the knife-like bill of the oyster catcher. All curlews have down-curved bills. Snipe rarely extend their legs upward. They and the dowitchers have rather straight bills, never upturned. The bill of the willet isn't as long in head lengths. No, the only bird this could be is a godwit. Not just some kind of sandpiper, but a specific group of shorebirds with only four species in the entire world. Now you're on your way to a foolproof bird identification. We can do the same with a female house sparrow versus a first year white crown sparrow. The plumage can be very similar, but the shape is different between these two sparrows. Pause the video here and see how many differences you can find between these two. Compare body size to head size, tail length to head length. Note the head shape and bill shape. Do you see the differences? Can you describe them? Do you see that a white crowned sparrow is longer, but that the house sparrow has a bigger and bulkier body and head? Next, we move on to color and pattern. This is the traditional identification method made popular by Roger Torrey Peterson in his 1934 book, Field Guide to the Birds. It uses a few key field marks to separate similar species. Used with size and shape, you can quickly identify many of the common birds you see, and at a surprising distance or with only a brief view. Contrasting plumage patterns are more important than absolute colors. This method is still quite valid to identify birds. To use it well, you need to study the introduction in your field guide. Know the parts of a bird by heart. Understand the feather patterns of the head. That will make sparrow identification much easier. And I have a video on that. Before you tackle immature gulls or juvenile shorebirds, you must know exactly the feathers of the wing. Knowing these basics will help your identification of all birds. Some common field marks shown by all groups of birds include such things as eye stripes, eye ring, wing bars, contrasting throat or rump patches, and such things as white outer tail feathers. Field marks also include tail shape or crest and obvious structural features of size and shape that we discussed earlier. And don't forget the color of any bare skin or legs and feet. And look at the bill and see if there's a difference between the upper mandible and the lower mandible color. Behavior is an important identification clue that is often overlooked. It is a supporting character that can help confirm an identification. Examples include the upside down trunk crawling of nuthatches. This nuthatch-like behavior is important to note when you're separating a black and white warbler from a black-throated gray warbler. The tail bobbing of the spotted sandpiper is well known. Tail bobbing is also important to note on flycatchers. Is the tail jerked up sharply and then allowed to slowly fall? Or is it the opposite? Is the tail pulled down quickly and then slowly raised? Of course, if your bird is swimming or diving, that can help you zero in on what it might be or what it might not be. Many bird watchers give up when observing flying birds. Flight includes steady flapping, flap glide flight, gliding, and soaring. Wings can be stiff or fluid. The wings themselves can be short or long, rounded or pointed at the tip. And you can observe diagnostic color patterns even on birds flying overhead. Keep watching a bird when it flies away. What field marks can you see and for how long? Is there a pattern to how it flaps its wings? Finally, birds make sound. Some people can tell hummingbirds apart from the sound of their wing trill. The song of the Wilson snipe is made by its tail feathers, as is the popping noise made by Anna's hummingbirds in its display dive. Hunters call some ducks whistlers because of their wing noise. The wing whistle of morning doves is different from other doves and pigeons in North America. The song of a woodpecker is 
drumming on dead tree branches or your downspout at 5 a.m. Ruffed grouse make their distinctive drumming by flapping their wings. Toeys and fox sparrows make quite a ruckus in the woods as they jump kick and turn over leaves on the ground. The free Merlin app uses your phone to identify the songs and calls of birds. It's about 85% accurate, which is better than many bird watchers. Just make sure to verify with a sighting or play back the recording and verify that that's what it really is. You can email recordings to others for their input or add it to your eBird checklist. As it's recording, Merlin displays the name of the bird that's singing at that particular time. This makes it so easy to follow along as you learn the calls and songs of birds. You should really put it on your phone. The Merlin app does excellently with warbler songs and sparrow chips. It can hear cedar waxwings much farther away than I can now. It's especially useful in spring when many birds are calling all at once. It's a tool. Think of it as having a fellow birder with you who says, I think I hear a Wilson's warbler. It struggles with road noise and in windy conditions or if people are talking at the same time. And it accurately identifies all the birds that the mockingbird is mimicking, but sometimes doesn't identify the mockingbird itself. So just be aware if you're around starlings or chats or some finches when they're singing because they do incorporate other bird songs into there. At this point, we leave the birds themselves and talk about expectation, status, distribution, and habitat. The maps in your field guide are a general indication of what birds are present where. They are usually color-coded to separate breeding or summer from the non-breeding or winter ranges. They sometimes also put in migration corridors and rare occurrences. Maps in books are older than their publication date and bird populations change over time. Up to the minute range maps using real data is found on the ebird.org website. Enter your county name into the list and you can have it build a checklist that shows you the abundance of birds in your local area every week of the year. Summer and winter ranges in your field guide depend on the life history of each individual species. Looking at a range map, you may think that the American Dipper is widespread from Alaska into Mexico, but actually they are found only on the wildest of rushing mountain streams. Sagebrush sparrows do live in sagebrush, but names can be misleading. Solitary sandpipers nest in the summer in spruce trees in the boreal forest. To find one in spring migration, look during the last half of April and first week of May in shallow flooded pastures and weedy farm ponds. But you'll probably never find a solitary sandpiper on a sandy beach. Look near the ground in marshes for common yellow throats in summer. But to find the Townsend's warbler, you need to go up into the mountains and look in the tops of the pine trees. Two different warblers, two different habitats. In migration though, birds may be found in just about any habitat. Many songbirds migrate at night and in the morning when the sun rises, they find the nearest green space. That could be in a desert or in your backyard. If you think you've identified a bird, but it isn't the right region or season or habitat, you may need to take another look. And that brings us to similar species. Birds are not just common or rare. They span the whole spectrum from birds where you may see a hundred a day or just one a day or one a season or one every 20 years. Rare is relative. When you see a bird that you don't see every day, ask yourself, am I sure? What else could it be? Could it be an aberrant bird? Bird plumage can be abnormally light or dark, and white feathers are common. If you see a bird that looks like a crow, but has white wing patches, that's just what it is, an American crow. And that's where size and shape really helps us from being fooled. Hybrids is another problem. Such groups as ducks and gulls frequently hybridize. This can happen where the range of two closely related species overlap. An example is northern flickers. There are the yellow shafted flickers in the east and the red shafted flickers in the west. Where their ranges meet in the Great Basin, they hybridize and they don't care what color they are. 
This has caused scientists to lump them into one species, the northern flicker. Check your winter flickers and look for birds with mixed characters. There's always the possibility that you'll find a bird that has escaped from captivity. Ducks from around the world are kept in captivity and they often escape. Parrots are legally kept as pets in the United States, but escaped parrots have established feral breeding populations in southern urban areas such as Miami, Houston, and Los Angeles. A strange bird you see is likely to be an unfamiliar plumage of a common bird rather than something rare. David Sibley talks about bias in the introduction to his book, The Sibley Guide to Birds. We often see what we want to see or what we expect to see. Our mind fills in the blanks of what we didn't see or it dismisses the things we see that don't fit with what we expect. However, rare doesn't mean never. There's no reason you couldn't see a rare bird, one that shows up only a few times a season. It's rare, but regular. In fact, Sibley said that overlooking a rare species is probably much more frequent than mistaking a common bird for a rare one. That's probably true once you learn the common birds of your area. But at first, beginner birders can make these mistakes when they don't concentrate enough on distribution and habitat. Size and shape, color and pattern, behavior and vocalizations, distribution and habitat, similar species. You now have a method of identifying birds that will lead to less errors. Birders love to identify birds they've never seen before, to add species to their life list. We all want to name every bird we see, even those we don't see well. This leads to mistakes. If we're not sure, it's wisdom on our part to just let the bird go unidentified, no matter how much it pains us. Thank you for watching. And be sure to check the description for those websites and books and apps that I mentioned.